Welcome to Fret Buzz the Podcast. I'm Joe McMurray. And I am Aaron Sefcik. And today we have drummer, music activist, and board of directors member of El Sistema USA. Um, he works with the Soundscapes in Virginia. Um, his name is Joe Ham, and I've had the opportunity to actually perform with him and get to know him, and welcome. Hey, thank you. Happy to be on. Thanks, Aaron and Joe. Yeah, yeah awesome. It's great to have you. Yeah, so Joe actually was recruited to play a show on New Year's Eve with me. Um, both of us were recruited by a vocalist, uh, flute player, and we showed up and showed up to that first rehearsal, I guess one of two rehearsals, and uh, I was struck by, one, your enthusiasm, um, two, your overall knowledge of everything, um, but you're just extremely easy to get along with and um, you took some interest in fret buzz and you brought up that uh, you might have some some interesting things to say for our listeners so thank you um, yeah. and uh, by the way Jennifer Gamble is the artist you're talking about she just won mm -hmm. a year music award uh, Virginia mm -hmm. has a, a award system uh, that's been going on for a couple of years now it's sort of turning into our Virginia Grammys yeah um, so anyway so she just won a, a jazz award with that yes yeah, her her uh, album that she recorded um, she actually recorded that with um, Jay Sinnott and his band as they were the backing band and Jay if you're from the Hampton Roads region you probably hear Jay every night almost if you listen to NPR um, he runs the jazz programming at night for NPR and so he if you actually listen to her album it's excellent because yeah, I, I, the band yeah. is so good, and she is amazing. So, I studied with Jay in college. He he was the oh. gym teacher that um, challenged me the best, and actually still challenges me the best. I'm I'm due for a lesson. <laughs> where did all. you <laughs> <laughs> Where did you do your music uh, schooling? Uh, I I studied jazz uh, performance at Christopher Newport University. Okay. With a specialization in percussion, drums? Uh, I, uh, I kind of had a little journey. I didn't know I wanted to study music when I got to school. Uh, mm -hmm. But I auditioned for a big band and combo and uh, was able to make it in to the, to the groups through audition. Mm -hmm. After I played with them for a semester, uh, I said, hey, I'm just going to throw myself into this thing. I'm just going to figure out how to make a career in music. Um, and declared a percussion major because there was no major yet. And then eventually jazz studies. Okay. Yeah. So did you already have um were you already interested in jazz before that? I played particularly jazz. jazz. I played jazz for one semester in or, or one year in high school. Um and before that, that's really it. Uh I, I started by playing punk rock in about eighth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, I mowed grass for a summer with my friend Christoph and uh who's now out in LA doing film editing and we mowed a lot of grass, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Mowed, there's a great music store called Contemporary Music Center up in Northern Virginia, actually, out, out in Chantilly. I don't know if you all are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. But yeah, Menzi, Menzi Pittman was the guy that started. Um, and I remember when I uh, saved up enough money, I went over to there, and I was like, all right, I'm ready to buy a drum set. And he was like, are you sure you don't want to play bass? <laughs> and he tried to convince me to play bass because I have like pretty like large hands, and he was like, "You might want to play bass." I was like, "No, I'm I'm gonna play drums." And uh, anyway, so yeah, punk rock, man. That was how I got started. <laughs> I heard that drums or that uh, jazz was like some of the hardest music to play mm -hmm. for drummers, and I was like, "Okay, let me try that." So I didn't get into it because I was interested in the genre. I was interested because in I heard it was hard. But then once I started playing, I was like, "Oh man, this is amazing." I'm super hooked on this so yeah that's kind of how we got into it very cool do you have any uh were there any jazz drummers you were listening to that really inspired you early on uh i would say max roach uh art blakey elvin jones those are three of the yeah the big guys there's some good ones especially, especially max roach just max roach is a very lyrical player um a lot of a lot of melody in his drumming Mm -hmm. and you don't I, I didn't typically think of drumming as a melodic instrument before i really started getting into him so he he's his era i mean he's back in the 40s right max 
Mm-hmm. Now, Art Blakey's like a little bit later, right? 50s, mm-hmm. like more of the Miles Davis era. Yeah, and Elvin Middle Jones. Miles J- Davis. Mm-hmm. Okay. For for our listeners who don't really understand what you're saying when you say a drummer as melodic, how would you explain that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, Joe and I were talking about this, about how, you know, having a drummer on a guitar player uh, podcast, like, there's really cool intersections that you can explore, and that's kind of like what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, I mean, a melody is one single line, right? One one line of music, of uh, notes happening, you know, one after another. Drums uh, is a collection of, uh, a drum set is a collection of, of, of notes, essentially, of, of pitches, rather. And you can play melodically. You can write melodies. You can play London Bridges Falling Down. You can play all kinds of Christmas songs and stuff like that on the drums. And it's a relative pitch. It's not a, it's not a actual pitch. Right. Um, and you can get pretty close uh, if you really are trying to tune your drum to that pitch. Right. But if you play London Bridges Falling Down on the drum set, people will know. Yeah. Playing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it, that, that's a lot different than just thinking of the drums as playing a beat. Yeah. Yeah. So you can integrate those concepts together when you're when you're writing parts. I know that there's a lot of drummers out there that that uh, don't go through the process of tuning their drums and kind of conceptualize what the idea of tuning their drums actually means, <laughs> and especially to a specific song. That's you know that's getting into pretty good detail of you have a specific song and then kind of tuning your drums to that song so it kind of resonates with the rest of the band that's going on. Oh yeah, I mean sympathetic resonation is really important um, mm. when you're putting a group together so that you don't get any weird nodes or uh, sonic conflict. Yep. Um, but I typically like to tune my toms in fourths or thirds, depending right. on the, the size of the drums I'm using and if those are if those drums like those um, those intervals or not. Right. Because each drum has a natural pitch range, so try to work within what what I got to work with but um, but yeah it's important to think musically as a drummer you can't just throw beats down to things you got to be listening you know Joe we were playing or we've been playing for the past like a, maybe two months or so mm-hmm. and there's a, there's a lot of listening going on yeah you know? I I in particular remember uh, playing the St. Thomas it's a Sonny Rollins tune um, you are it, it is like you're playing the melody with us Mm-hmm. It's uh, you're definitely not playing a standard rock drum beat on that. You've got the bump, ba dum, bump, ba dum, bump, bum, bum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fun to, it's it's enjoyable to play with a drummer who does that because you don't always get that. I mean, there's a lot of information in the melody. There's a lot of information. You can't throw that out. You need yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter what genre you're playing either. We're we're kind of talking about playing solos, you know, in jazz styles, but this has nothing to do with jazz. This has to do with opening your ears up, and and again, this is not just a drummer. This is all musicians, mm-hmm. you know. Like, I don't know, Aaron. What's your what's your take on all that? Um, I I mean, going through years and years and years of playing with drummers, and then also teaching uh, drummers in a band situation, um, I find more often than not there are a lot of drummers who aren't aware of the melodic capabilities of the drums. Um, I think that a lot of people do think of it as just, you know, the, the rhythm section. Um, and it's, you know, sometimes a little bit of a hurdle to kind of get over that and try to get the drummer to actually conceptualize. Like when we go through, I know in a band situation, when we go through uh, a chord progression or some kind of um, progression within the song, I always try to get the drummer to be involved, uh, especially because they need to know exactly what's going on within the music. I have a, I noticed that there's a tendency for drummers just as soon as you start talking about chord progressions or um, sections of a song, the drummer kind of just leans back and does their own thing and waits for the band to, you need me to come in? Okay, one, two, three, four. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You're a part of this just as much as everybody else. You know, you even though you may not be hitting some strings or playing some keys, uh, you would definitely have a musical instrument in front of you and you need to know exactly what's going on at all times. Whether that's just, you know, 
you need to make sure that you're understanding that each section may call for a specific feel or a different approach. And if you're not paying attention to that conversation, then you're blindly just going into that part. And that's not really what that part needs. We need someone who's in tune to what's going on, the language that's actually being spoken between all of us as musicians. So, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, it, totally. Yeah, I mean, drummers, uh, they're, they're the foundation. And I can never... I, I, I'm always telling my, my students, is like, you are the foundation, you and the bass. And that's, everybody's relying on you. That's extremely important that you're carrying everybody and everybody's looking at you to kind of feel that, that, that rhythm that's going on. You, you hold a very, very important part of this whole thing that's going on. And it seems like in, uh, in school, a lot, of, a lot of the percussion players, almost all of them end up playing some sort of pitched percussion like xylophone marimba right at some point um and i found i guess the drummers that i have played with that have that background whether it's you joe or if it's like sean rogers from kairos quintet mm. aaron and i's old band they actually end up i mean i think they have a greater enjoyment of the music because they are able to partake in the discussions and i mean i remember sean our old drummer he was just as knowledgeable about chord progressions and music theory as anybody else in the band. So he yeah. was able to have input throughout the right songwriting process outside of just the percussion side of things. And I think that was fulfilling for him and it gave him more value to the band. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I came up at, uh, playing piano. Uh, my mm -hmm. dad played piano when I was, when I was a kid and I have a really big family and a lot of people play piano or guitar. My uncle Pat played guitar. My uncle Phil is a great bass player. Um, uh, another, another uncle, uh, <laughs> got a lot of uncles, <laughs> a lot of the classical pianists. So I grew up hearing lots of sounds, but mm -hmm. piano was first. Um, for me, what really did it as far as developing my ear was just ear training class. In uh, age. Because I'm sitting behind the drum set. I don't have a piano next to me. When we're talking about chords, if I'm going to be able to make a suggestion in a songwriting process or know where I am in the chord progression, I have to be able to hear where mm -hmm. I am. I have to be able to do like the, um, the Roman numeral analysis to whatever I'm playing in, like mm -hmm. during that song. Uh, so that was really the thing that did it for me. That's a really interesting point because if I ever get lost a little bit, I can hear if I'm not right and I can hear when I'm back on, but you don't have any anything to test to be like, am I with them? Am I where I think I am? <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, melody and just knowing the chord progression. Just gotta, yeah. I gotta know what key. I gotta, I gotta know where one is. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could just always count, never stop. <laughs> that would be the first way to fix, I guess, all this. Yeah, but, yeah, counting though, I don't. Uh, I mean, it, you can't though, always count every beat. Sometimes yeah, you gotta feel blocks of measures. Yeah, but, phrases. Feeling phrases is more yeah. what I pr appreciate, knowing where I am in the phrase and where I am in the chord progression, when when the cadence is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's kind of like my roadmap right there. Because you can count all day, but I mean, I don't know. I, I prefer to feel phrases and feel melodies and just know that four has passed or know that eight or 12 has passed right. than to be like, 10, 2, 3, 4, 11, 2, 3, 4, 12, 2, 3. Okay, now I gotta play a symbol. It's fun. Like, no, I'm not a Lego. <laughs> a Lego? Yeah, I'm not like a block. I'm not playing in blocks, you know? I'm not. Right. Okay, okay. Like, oh, it's new phrase, 12, yeah. 8, 4, whatever. You know, it's not really. I've never heard anybody use the Lego out. analogy. I used to love Legos. I used to build giant Lego <laughs> scenes. Oh, yeah. Somebody gave yeah. me a 172 Lego piece. Oh, there you set. go. <laughs> um, very small pieces. Awesome. Yeah, I haven't Nano box. Box. I've never even yeah. heard of that. I don't know how. No, I should make a music video of me playing this or something like this. But make it sound really awesome. How big is it? It's very small. You'd have to do one of those stop action videos with a teeny yeah. lego man yeah you actually so also i didn't i didn't <laughs> bring this up earlier but joe is an excellent video 
videographer and video editor. Um, so it seems like this would be up your alley to do. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> that's actually how I met Jennifer um, at a film festival. My my film about El Sistema and soundscapes. I made a ten minute documentary to help explain it. And okay. uh, my film was accepted to the Proteus Festival in the fall in Virginia Beach, and it was screened in, at the Regal Cinema, which is cool. Really, yeah. it's, I, I never thought I would see that film on a on big screen. Um, but anyway, so that's how I met Jennifer, and I was like, "This is weird. I'm here as a filmmaker, but it's also a music festival, so I feel sort of weird." Like I yeah, felt weird calling myself a filmmaker for a while, but because um, anyway, you consider I, yourself first and foremost a musician. Yeah, I'm a musician. Yeah, most definitely. That's how I've dedicated like my whole life as a musician. Yeah. I just happen to make films now, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's how I met Jennifer. She was like, oh, yeah, I've got this gig coming up or whatever. Anyway, we're kind of back to how Joe and I met. The film, it seems like musicians are always in need of film services because we need, you know, with the the age of Facebook and Instagram, people rarely click on an mp3 they want something to look at while they listen to the music yeah i mean the visual is so important to look the way that music sounds you know it's all it's all integrated i think that it yeah if you can shape the listener's experience by letting them see what i guess you're envisioning from your music it kind of takes out some of the some of the personal um, creativity from it like I I like to close my eyes and listen to music and kind of I don't know I have I see things it, may, it it makes me think of things when I'm listening to music and I have my eyes closed and if I'm watching a video I get wrapped up in the visuals a lot and I don't necessarily take yeah. in the music yeah. as deeply oftentimes during any one of my classes if I pull up YouTube or some kind of video to listen to the song um, what I will do is I will purposefully minimize the window because any student that as soon as I pull up a video, their interest goes straight to what's going on visually. And I, and I purposely say, no, that's not why we're doing this. I want you to use your ears. I want you to actually look through your ears and find like all the parts that are going on within the song listen to the transitions, listen to the beat, listen to the things, the instrumentation that's going on. And if that video is up in front of them, they're zoned into the pictures that are going on in front of them. And then I'll stop the video and say, I'll ask them a question. And they have no idea what I'm talking about because they were so interested in what was going on with the video aspect of things. I'm like, ah, oh, you're missing the point. <laughs> yes, that's sort of deprivation. That's kind of like what you're getting at. It um, can really heighten your awareness of sound the other side of it is um like immer like sensory immersion right so mm -hmm. i like the idea of being uh, of being like okay well how does this smell how does this look how does this feel how does this sound mm -hmm. like you, you bring all of your senses together to try to create something if you're going to eat food that reminds you of the way that this sounds how would that food taste if you're going to smell something like you could put a scent in a, a if you could um diffuse an essential oil or something like that. What, which would you put on? Um, which would dif you diffuse? Huh. Make it smell like the way that that sounds. Like, does that sound smoky? Does that does that sound like it would smell smoky? Does that sound like it would smell bright and minty? Or does that sound like it would be more um, relaxed, like lavender? You know. But you do that through the colors that you're choosing on the screen because obviously we don't have like a little smell box attached to our laptops <laughs> not yet <laughs> it's gonna like shoot up a little black like it's a country song and it's gonna shoot up a little puff of a barbecue smoke from the, from the grill or <laughs> so, some old blues dude and there's a, a little bit of a cigarette smoke smell that comes out when you're trying to describe the that <laughs> stale beer are you meaning like by like video? Like what do, you, what do you mean by? Yeah. So how do you actually get the smell to come across in video footage by have showing you, pictures of that scene of a smoky scene? Um, have you seen the matrix? It's been a long time. Yes. Okay, you know how like it's super green. Mm-hmm. There's just a vibe to that whole movie. 
Mm. Okay. Right? And if you listen to the soundtrack that goes with it, it's all... Uh, there's like a lot of crescendoing, like French horn, trombone. Uh, it's very, there's like a there's tension, like throughout that whole movie. Um, okay. Another one is, uh, ah, what was that movie? Uh, Guillermo del Toro was the director. It was about a man that's a fish and the woman falls in love with this fish guy. Uh, oh. ah, what is that called? I can't, I don't know. But that whole movie is blue. And okay. What he wanted to do is he wanted to create... Uh, you wanted to symbolize the fact that this underwater sea creature was a sea creature. So he made the entire movie blue until the woman fell in love with the sea creature. And then she wore a red dress, and it was the first time you had seen red in like an hour. And when she wears a red dress, you're like, damn, look at that color. Yeah. Just because you haven't seen it in a while. And you could do the same thing with sounds. Uh, as a drummer, I could not play any cymbals at all for like two minutes and 45 seconds of a song and then play cymbals on the bridge. And nobody's heard cymbals for two minutes and 45 seconds. That's a long time in a rock song or a pop song. Yeah. When you hear those cymbals, your ears just open up and you're like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I mean, people hear cymbals every day. Cymbals aren't like a crazy sound, but that's an example of, I guess, um, deprivation of that certain sound right. and that can evoke that that sort of feeling so um, I don't know the same thing is the case with the with a meal you know you could uh, have a whole chocolate meal or <laughs> a whole chocolate meal a whole chocolate dessert I mean I'm down for a chocolate meal <laughs> um, I don't care what if it's Valentine's Day or whatever I love but okay and then you put one strawberry on there when you eat that strawberry you're going to be like, whoa, what is that? You know? <laughs> it stands um, out, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just a, it's a matter of holding some things back and waiting a little while. So uh, I like sensory deprivation because it opens up your ears. You know, and so to get rid of video and say, forget all of this, um, this overstimulation that we live in. Mm -hmm. We live with screens and ads, and it's crazy. It's like back to the future. Yeah, yeah. He goes to the future, and it's like, when he goes to... 2015 is really far in the future. Oh my gosh. Just screens everywhere and flying stuff. Um, that's what life is sort of like for us. You, know, you go to the gas station, there's like gas station TV. Yeah. Like, I don't want to watch gas station TV. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's good to, to kind of focus your mind. So, yeah, Aaron, I'm, I'm all about that. I'm all about focusing, yeah. focusing students or ourselves, but it's also good to play with all the senses oh yeah so your video that you made about el sistema that brought you to this uh video what do you call it a film conference you said it was it was a video talking about the general uh mission of el sistema yeah so um, and so i don't think our we haven't explained at all okay, what so el sistema is to our audience Okay, uh, I'll try to I'll try to explain this. So, El Sistema is a philosophy that enables people to have access to music at an intense level and at a very high quality, with a social mission behind it. That's the goal. So, music is elitist. Art is elitist. It's elitist because it's expensive. So if you don't have access to equipment or lessons, like the teaching that you guys both do, right. then you don't have the chance to be able to learn something. I mean, you can play drums and stuff like that, but if, I mean, we're talking about getting to the level of the conversation that we're having today about textures and senses and you know philosophy on playing and melody and things like that. I mean, that's taken all of us years of, of training and work and study to be able to just joke around on a podcast. Right. But that's, you know, these are concepts we take seriously. We want to make sure that that, that experience is accessible to people. And um, not just for art's sake, but as a, as a social function. Um, so that's what El Sistema is. Uh, one way of explaining it is that an orchestra is a great example of a model society. You have 100 people 
ish, let's just say 100, all working together for, for common. Doesn't matter whether you're playing uh, the first violin or the second clarinet or you're the conductor or you're playing a few notes in the percussion section, your part is critical to the entire piece coming together. And that is an analogy for society. It doesn't matter whether you are um, a, a, a leader statewide or a national leader, or whether you are uh, a custodian, or you are somebody that's painting lines on a street. All these people are equal, uh, of equal importance, because if something doesn't go right, everyone knows. Sort of the analogy of the orchestra to society, and it's important that children that are born into poverty have the opportunity to access music education for free. So El Sistema supports other organizations that are trying to bring music into the community? Is that how so, it works? El Sistema is a philosophy. It originated in uh, 1975 by Jose Antonio Abreu, who is an economist and social reformer and pianist uh, in Venezuela. And because of the, the need in Venezuela and the, um, the, the, the murder rates and the poverty and the water quality issues and the standard of living issues, he connected that seeing that giving people money or, or giving people some sort of um, assistance, literal assistance, was not as important of value and the feeling of self worth. It's something to contribute to the world and having a purpose. So, by starting with a sense of um, of spiritual wealth, not in the religious sense, but in just feeling self worth, the material wealth um, follows that. So, he said, "Okay, here's an instrument." Here's a music stand. Come to this uh, garage at this time. And he had, I think, uh, I don't know what the story is, 14, 14 students or something like that showed up. And um, now there's hundreds of thousands of kids in uh, Venezuela and thousands of kids in the United States and kids all over the world now studying music for free at an intense level. And those kids for over 40 years now have a feeling that they have something to contribute. And so these people have become doctors and architects and you name it. It's almost like it's better than any, any welfare assistance you could give to people. Like you're saying, if you just get, give people, give, give somebody a fish and they eat for a day, give, teach a man to fish and they eat for a lifetime. You're kind of giving them an opportunity that gives them something to strive for and tend to, they end up being a more successful person who doesn't need assistance in the future. It sounds like it's important that, that people feel like they have something to contribute to the world and that they are needed. And when somebody comes to the orchestra or let's just say to the ensemble, because we're not going to be genre specific here mm -hmm. because we do uh, rap hip hop and we do creative composition, music making, and we do, whatever genres the kids come up with and jazz and rock. Um, they're needed in the ensemble. I don't care if they play one note. I don't care if they are the triangle player. Like if they're not there, it matters and they need to feel that. And if they can feel that, 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 that sense of self-worth starts changing. Now it doesn't matter if your car is broken down or if your house is not in great condition. You know, we need you in the ensemble. You're important. And you're missed. And if you're not there, you're going to get a phone call and someone's going to say, hey, we missed you today. You know, we need you here tomorrow. And that, that kind of person will walk a long way. <laughs> we have stories of kids walking to school just to make it to the, those ensembles. Yeah, so I bet. I bet. How does. OK, so <clears throat> real quick question. How does one get um involved not so much from a teacher's point of view but from a someone who may be um on the less unfortunate side how would someone like that get involved and, and go about doing the program is this an online thing is this uh somewhere that they can go within their community and how do they look all of that up well this is um 
these programs happen in person. So there are in-person ensembles. Professional musicians are hired as teaching artists who okay. are active paid um, musicians that are performing and writing and recording and all that kind of thing. These happen at typically schools that have uh, high levels of need. So Title I elementary schools, Title I middle high schools, for example, schools that are uh, at some point below or above the poverty uh, poverty level. So at the school that Soundscapes were, uh, the program that I manage is at, I think about 80% of the kids are living at or below the poverty level. Okay. And so any of the kids at that school are eligible to join the program by lottery. And that's how a lot of the, the programs throughout the United States are. Okay. And this is during school hours at school? This is typically after school, although uh, it can it can range depending on the program models nationally and internationally. Uh, internationally, it's the you know, school structures are different, so right. you know depending on how your school is set up, it could go either way. In the United States, a lot of the uh, crime and gang activity that are happening between the hours of three and six, when parents are not home, and school is out. So by taking up that time and using it in a, a fun way that makes you want to come there and with your friends, then it makes it easy to want to join something. Um, but some of the programs are also integrated during the school day and after school as well. This reminds me of a lot of the arguments in support of um, school athletics. I mean, it's, it's perfect because it, it does the same thing and it gives students of a different mindset an opportunity to do something you know maybe they don't want to play football or soccer or whatever the key is access and having an access barrier which exists in our society because of our nation's history of racism and segregation and just we have issues in our country right um, and we have to acknowledge those issues acknowledge what it means to grow up in uh communities that have access to things and also acknowledge that there are still communities that exist now that do not have access to things that others have. <laughs> and so um, equity is really important. Equality is not what we need. We need equity. If we all got the same thing, then some people would have a whole lot extra of one thing and others would have very little of another thing. So we need to kind of balance out levels, which means different groups of people, different communities, different need different kinds of things so that's the concept of social equity and that's why we're making music education uh accessible to different communities okay and so was soundscape started independently of el sistema yes so uh, el sistema is not a chain it's not a franchise but it's a supporter of it's a philosophy programs that sees fit. Okay, so El Sistema is a philosophy, the system. Okay, it's a, it's a philosophy, and that philosophy spread organically throughout the world once people started knowing what it was. Uh, there were about uh, four programs that started in the United States around 2008, 2009. Soundscapes, where I work, was one of those programs, mm. and now there are 110 member programs of El Sistema USA, which, mean they, which means they meet a uh, certain criteria. And then there are 160 total programs that identify as El Sistema inspired in the United States. Okay. Uh, and there are even more programs globally. There are, there are programs on every continent, except Antarctica, because, you know. Doesn't really count. Because it's yeah. Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's a philosophy. So nobody went out and said, I'm going to start a program here. I'm going to start, I'm not going to, I'm going to plant these, these things, these seeds. Nobody went out and did that. Exactly. The, the ideas spread through, um, through word of mouth, through, um, you know, videos like my video. And uh, there was a 60 minutes special that was really critical. A lot of people were inspired by that. Um, and also uh, national conferences. I was in Detroit two weeks ago during the, I guess, polar vortex uh, oh, yeah. craziness. Yeah. Uh, I managed to come back with a nose, which is nice. It was negative thirty there. Hard you don't to need, imagine. You don't need a you don't need a nose to drum. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. I guess it's, not the only, it's one of the only things you don't need. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's how that's how the concept spread. Okay. So it would be um, any any kind of music program that is intensive, that has uh, that is socially equitable, um, that is ensemble driven. Those are a couple examples of criteria mm -hmm. for, for El, as an El Sistema program. You could have an El Sistema guitar ensemble. You could have a whole bunch of guitars. Um, you could have a rock band. Mm. But you need to be intense. You need to be, you know, doing it like 10, 12 hours a week. You need to be make sure that people that didn't have access to guitars before or transportation to get to the lesson could get there. Mm. You know, I could I could go on. And and yes. that's and that's what you guys so now at, at Soundscapes, that's what you guys are implementing there. That's right. Okay. Yep. So we've uh, we've spent probably close to uh, five million dollars over about ten years, mm -hmm. and reached nearly uh, a thousand individual students, but m most of them for multiple years per student. So about four hundred kids per year okay. uh, uh, access the program. That's Sorry, I'm just soaking in all of this. I'm. I, I, yeah, I mean, like the role of El Sistema is still, it's hard to grasp. Like, did you hear about El Sistema first and then seek out soundscapes? Or were, did you find soundscapes and then just decide, like, we should, I heard about this thing called El Sistema, we should meet the standards of this just because it seems like the right thing to do? Oh, great. Is there a benefit um, to, like if you do meet the criteria of El Sistema, what are the benefits that you then receive? I mean, I understand it's a philosophy, but I feel like there's got to, like, do they do any sort of, do they help with funding? Do they do political, like, do they do things to help in your political system have more funding for the arts in schools? What, how does it all fit together? I'm still trying yeah. to figure out. That's a lot of questions. First of all, we're not talking about the arts. <laughs> We're not talking about the arts, we're talking about music. Music mm -hmm. is different. Music is in real time. Music is happening now, every moment, while other people are playing with you. And everybody's having to react and listen at the exact same time. It's different than um, it's different than painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, if everyone was painting the same painting at the same time and nobody knew what they were gonna paint before they started. Like that would maybe be an example, um, but it's 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 different music. So we're trying to differentiate music from the arts, right? Music is um, the only thing that we know of. Like I get you, we, we being like the scientific um, knowledge, the general scientific knowledge that engages both hemispheres of the brain at the same time. Hmm. So there's fMRI uh, scans of the brain lighting up both hemispheres at the same time. When so you're playing, music. you're playing music. Yes. Okay. So music is, is unique and interesting and special neurologically. So that's one reason why uh, mu music is the, what we're trying to focus on. Um, uh, let's see. My origin to El Sistema came because I was, I was playing in a professional rock band. We were being shopped to major labels in uh, 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, during the financial crash, bad timing. Yeah. Okay. All of the labels went out of like their A and R guys all got cut. Mm -hmm. um, artist development budgets gone. Like it was, it was, it was like really disappointing because we were well positioned to to um, move forward in the traditional way that music labels were operating at the time, and just the rug got pulled from underneath of them. So. While that was happening, while my my rock band was continuing to work with our management out of um, out of New York City and Connecticut to advocate for the group, I was playing gigs in town, teaching at like three places, and I got contacted to teach Bucket Band at a at a program, and I was like, Bucket Band was that? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. We'll see how it goes, and that ended up being the El Sistema program. Ah. Uh. Bucket band, like bucket drum, like what you see on the street and 
DC when there's a guy beating on five gallon buckets and it's yeah only uh, twenty five kids at at the same time. Mm, that's cool. Um, buckets is a great entry level into music because it doesn't cost anything. I mean, a bucket is like less than five dollars, mm -hmm. and if you break it, you didn't break a five hundred dollar guitar, or you know, you can get another bucket. Like practically speaking, you can teach a lot of kids really quickly with buckets and make a class. Mm -hmm. uh, you can teach tons of different musical concepts with buckets and you can teach kids to treat a bucket as an instrument and in that it is important and that there's a way to take care of this thing. There's a way to play it. You can teach a lot of musicianship. And once they get past the rite of passage of a bucket, you can give them a real instrument and they, those concepts will transfer. Hmm. Okay. So that's how I got into uh, teaching at Soundscapes and I kept growing within Soundscapes. Oh, so the Bucket Band was a Soundscapes program. Yeah, the Bucket Band is uh, is the entry level into music for kids into Soundscapes. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's how I got into the program, and then I and then I, I mean, I typically thought of making a music career as uh, I'm going to make records, I'm going to make music videos, I'm going to tour, which are the things that I did before I got into El Sistema. Right. And then I realized, oh, there's a social value of music. Like music has social value as a utility to society, the development of us as a people of the, in, in the United States. It, like it is important. It is useful to us, not just as a form of entertainment or pleasure or enjoyment. No. It can actually like help us develop our, our, our country. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, that's a benefit of it and the entertainment value of it and whatnot like that. But I mean, I, I know with, a lot of the students that I teach uh, from the get-go, whether there's a five-year-old little girl or a 13-year-old boy who comes in um, and they have um, social skills that aren't the best, they may be a little bit, you know, clammed up or a little bit quiet or whatnot like that. Um, as you go through teaching them the language of music and understanding, um, I hear from all kinds of parents that it's amazing how through the language of music and through um, ensemble um, or whether it's, you know, the idea of learning just the instrument itself, uh, parents always come up to me and tell me how much their child has changed over that period of time, whether it's six months, a year, or many years, and how that's helped them develop these social skills and how to talk within the community and kind of bring them out of their shell. And it's uh, it's not only just obviously a, an entertainment value, but there's a, there's a lot more to it in terms of learning an instrument and what that does for a person. Absolutely. And, you know, all of us are trying to build our careers. Um, you know, listeners that are interested or that are either hobbyists or people that are professional musicians that have that gig and get paid. I mean, we got to make careers. We got to get paid. We got to be able to make a living yeah. in some way. And uh, it is important that we, we, we think of these things. Um, it's important that we think of music for all that it's capable of rather than thinking, I need to only make records and only tour and you know the things that I understood it that's at least how i understood it before um i think of them as coexisting like i wouldn't want to only teach or only be in el sistema music i have to also be playing and performing and you know doing the, doing the thing but i gotta mm -hmm. coexist for me now 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 that i know what i know and i hope others can uh Think about that philosophy a little bit and think about the effect that you can have on the society of our country um, and not just about what song you're working on. Well, that's incredible. You don't come across your everyday musician doesn't have the same broader goals in mind that you you have. And it is it's almost just a mindset thing. Like, I mean, I I teach and perform and I don't think that I have had that i mean i i want it to be something positive but i haven't had that clear of a goal i don't think is to think like i'm i'm not just teaching this kid music i'm i'm helping the kids general life and i'm helping society it's just like a makes you feel better if anything it just makes you feel better about what you're doing 
Like you like don't have to really necessarily change anything. It's just like knowing that all of this, this thing that I'm so passionate about is that much better than I, it already was. Definitely. I mean, I'll give you one example of a, of a specific skill through music, uh, auditory discretion. So auditory discretion is when you are listening to one person and there's other stuff going on in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Northwestern University's Auditory Neuroscience Institute, um, Nina Krauss runs that program and she has done studies on auditory discretion and found that musicians have a really fantastic aptitude for auditory discretion. So that's because when you're playing guitar and you're listening to the drummer, you have to also be listening to the bass player. There's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different channels, mm -hmm. just like on a mixing board that you have to be able to listen and differentiate. But there's also the audience in the background. There's also some stupid TV that's on at the bar you're playing at, which, could, <laughs> which by the way, turn those TVs off. Yeah. <laughs> there's musicians playing. I don't care about anything else going on in the world. If you hired a musician to go on stage and entertain your people, turn the TVs off. Think of it. Uh, it's brutal when you start, you get caught up watching the television while you're playing. <laughs> it's <laughs> rocks at those TVs. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, sometimes I'm like playing and I'm I look across the bar and there's something comes up and I'm like, I start reading the headline and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. There's a lot of oh no's to say about headlines right now. But anyway, so what, you're, what you're able to do there is you're able to hear one thing, hear something else, be mad at something else, TV, whatever, see something. And somebody's else. yelling at you to, and somebody's yelling at you to play Freebird or Freebird. <laughs> you have to ignore them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also play your music. So you're able to have that auditory discretion skill. Yeah. And then when you're in class or you're at your job and you're trying to listen to somebody at a meeting or something important and something crazy happens in the background, musicians are better at staying focused and listening to that one thing because their channels have been clarified. Like we were talking about EQing out my bad sound. Well, you guys are musicians. You're able to tune out that bad sound easier than somebody that is not a trained musician because you have developed auditory discretion skills. Not that everybody doesn't have that, but musicians have that as a refined skill. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah, almost like in, like in a crowded bar uh, and you have 50 people there who are having individual conversations with each other and you being able to, even though there are 50 you know, conversations going on, you can channel in on any one of those conversations and listen to it, even though the, there is this mass sound that's going on. Uh, you can kind of individualize each conversation. Exactly. So that's an example of a skill built through ensemble playing intensely that translate into life. So that helps this student. Like that student could be in an L Sistema program for only three years. But after that, their brains are totally changed for the better mm. for life. And that helps them in all different areas. Goal achieved. They yeah. don't have to become a professional musician to... to to have um, to be successful for us to think of them as successful. They just have to, you know, develop as people and make progress and music can do that for people, which is great. Yeah. I always tell my students that I, I don't need them to become professional musicians. I don't expect that if they want that, that's great. But really the goal is that they enjoy it. And it's, uh, it becomes something like if anything, they just appreciate the music they hear more. Mm hmm. Yeah. aside from the the positive brain development things definitely and we know a lot of the benefits of music i mean it's it's well known anybody that's cutting music programs is being willfully ignorant to research because it's it's there it's a pile of research yeah it's like not a it's like uh willfully ignoring climate change like there's a ridiculous amount of information there should be music programs there's benefits to them and most importantly they there should be an equitable process for access. Um, and that's the thing that I, that uh, I didn't really understand before I got into this work is the equity side of it. So. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, uh, hopefully all of our listeners, you know, can at least check out El Sistema and 
you know, maybe see if there's any programs in their local areas. Um, and if anything, just be aware that it's that it's out there and that music is doing something positive for a society. Yeah, so lsystemausa.org, that's the national organization that supports all the independent uh, El Sistema uh, programs. So you can go to lsystemausa.org and check that out. And uh, if you're in uh, Virginia, um, Soundscapes, S-O-U-N-D-S-C-A-P-E-S.org is the uh, El Sistema program that I run uh, in Newport News, Virginia. And how big is your facility? We are. Uh, we have a partnership with the school system, so okay. we come in after school and we uh, work with um, the school day teachers, and we kind of transform their rooms for a couple hours. We oh yeah, do, yeah, yeah. We move desks around. We bring in whiteboards and music paper, and like we kind of turn them into uh, music classrooms, and then we turn them back into classrooms when we leave. And there is a curriculum that you follow. Uh, yep, we have a custom uh, rubric that we developed over over the past five or six years that are all of our different social and musical standards. And we play uh, arrangements of classical works. Okay. Like Finlandia or um, Beethoven, you know, different, or De Joy, things like that. We, we try to play, you know, pieces as close to the actual um, arrangement as possible. And then you said you also do things like hip hop and uh, whatnot like that as well. I said creative, creative composition. So we try to um, have programming where kids can write their own music. Okay. With their own melodies and their own beats that are socially relevant to their lives. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a great story out of, uh, out of Baltimore. I think uh, I have great, great friends there um, that do a lot of creative composition, music making. I think I remember a story about, and writing a piece of music about the transportation system there and how unreliable it was. And then this song was shared with the city. Right. And it heightened awareness about the public transportation. And that <laughs> allowed them to fix the public transportation. And then the kids were able to get to school on time. That's awesome. So socially uh, relevant musical concepts are really important because it's what's going on in our lives. They often say, write what you know. So, uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, genre specific too. I mean, orchestra is great for so many reasons. Uh, it's just also important to acknowledge that genres like rock or rap are respectable genres. Yeah. Okay. So there would be a, uh, all instruments apply. It depends on the, it depends on the program nationwide. There are different. Uh, there's some mariachi programs depending on where you are in the country, which is awesome. Cool. That's that's cool. Um, more jazz programs are starting to pop up. Um, the original El Sistema uh, program model was orchestra or, uh, orchestra programs. Okay. So most of the programs are orchestra. Um, we don't have a lot of guitar going on right now, but Ooh, that's a cool. lot of guitars get donated to us. So we've just been collecting them with the idea that we will one day do something with them. So I think it's only a matter of time. And those programs, depending on where you are within the country or the world, uh, mm -hmm. they're dictated by the, the, the individual who's running the program? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the program leader, the local program leader will be the one that is the artistic director and decide the direction of the program. Ideally, they are culturally relevant, right? Wherever they are in the world, right? Understandably. So where, where do you get the funding to do what you're doing? Um, most of the fundraising comes from individual donations. Um, we're also uh, we have a partnership with the public school system, so there's a lot of in-kind services like uh, transportation and facilities. Um, mm. And there's also some corporate social responsibility initiatives that we access, uh, like banks or uh, other businesses that want to give back to their communities. Um, they're interested in that. Uh, there's also some state uh, tax incentives for, um, for people to donate to nonprofits that we take advantage of as well. Um, Virginia Commission for the Arts, for example, um, is an organization, there's organizations that support programs like 
you know what we do. Uh, we're interesting because we're a music program with but with social goals. So we sometimes classify as a social program, like a social work program. Other mm -hmm. times as an artistic program. So we're sort of we're because we're at the intersection of those two. Um, we can and sometimes access either one of them or both. Okay. And so how many people go in to the school each? Is it every day that you guys go in? Yeah, we're uh, five days a week after school, uh, 10 hours of programming <laughs> per week. And how many people are with you? Uh, we have a teaching artist team of about 10. And yeah, they uh, work anywhere from four to 10 hours per week at the, at the site. Awesome. And is there a cap in terms of student enrollment? Uh, at that school, there's sort of a natural cap because we want to make our, we don't want to make our classes too big. Right. And um, it's just a matter of how many instruments we have at the time. Uh, the goal is to expand. Soundscapes has plans to expand within uh, the city that we're in, which is Newport News. I live in Norfolk, Virginia, but uh, the program is in Newport News, Virginia. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there Ideally, there's not a cap because there's way more kids in poverty that are not being served right, throughout right. the state and the country than are being served. So the cap is really about what makes sense uh, within the school. Right, right, right. Yeah, you still want to be able to give the individual individual attention to the kids that need it um, and being able to, but you obviously don't want to spread yourself too thin. Right. But it doesn't have to be at a school. It doesn't have to be a partnership with the public school system. Um, there are programs around the country that operate at community centers mm. that are totally independent of the school. Uh, and by the way, Soundscapes is a nonprofit, so it's not a, it's not a public school program. Mm. It's its own program that has a partnership with the school. Right. So right. if somebody wanted to start an El Sistema program, you could do it. Go for it. Give me a call. You know? Make it happen. Make a guitar L Sistema program. Make a make a rap L Sistema program. Like you can do it. How do they get in contact with you? Um, what's the best way to contact me? Uh, oh, website. <laughs> That's what we're asking you. <laughs> I would, I phone number out, but then I think that would be maybe kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You can contact me through my work email, I guess, um, which is J H A M M at soundscapes.org perfect that's a good way to that's a good way to start yeah yeah do you have a website of your own with like your any of the music that you've recorded or i do anything my, like that my website is joham.com h-a-m-m yeah. yeah that was my next question in terms of okay beyond the el sistema how about how about you joe what what do you do and i know you had mentioned that you guys uh were on the road to you know stardom uh whatever happened to all of that and what are you doing now and in, in your performance and um if we could tell us a little bit about yourself sure um okay so i guess i'll backtrack a little bit so the band that i was in was called chasing arrows and we uh were nominated for a woody award in 2008 at mtv woody award so yeah, yeah. They flew us to new york and put us up in a fancy hotel and drove us around and um we were at the award show and we didn't win the award but we made a lot of contacts and uh, a lot of great stories and good people and um those contacts led us to being able to be shop to all these major labels um, and during that, while that, the labels were kind of crashing out and AR was going, you know, was uh, being eliminated and R was being eliminated. We were told to just continue to grind, hmm. keep writing, keep performing labels. Want to see activity play as much as you can. So we were playing three hour shows, uh, like I guess, um, three to three to eight a month or so. Um, hmm. We were trying to play as much as we possibly could. Right. Most of the places that we could play to have that level of activity um, were places that were like bars and restaurants in the area. Um, so that's how we did it. And then, you know, people went their separate ways eventually. And, you know, people went to school and families developed and stuff like that, which happens to a lot of, a lot of groups. It, it just couldn't hang together. Um, the timing kind of couldn't, couldn't keep hanging. So after that finished, um, I wait before you go on. What was the music you were 
I mean, you say it's, it's a rock band, but like, what were you playing? Tell um, more about that music in that. Okay. Yeah. It was, uh, it was pop rock. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, really song driven music, lyric driven music. Yeah. Um, at the time you could kind of compare it to Foo Fighters, Matchbox 20 kind okay. of stuff. Cool. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of electronic elements, like a uh, computerized kind of stuff. It was like really of like a, very much like a rock and roll band. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can hear, so you can see some music videos and some live videos and uh, all that kind of stuff on my website. If you're interested. Chasing arrows. Yes. But at joham.com we can see all that. Yeah, I have it all. I have it all organized there. Excellent. Um, let's see. After that ended, I uh, didn't find another band to join immediately. So I kind of went back to jazz roots and I started making jazz bands and making events where I could play jazz on a regular basis and just getting involved in my community, started playing more because um, I hadn't played jazz as much at that time. Um, and recently I've been filling in for a couple different groups and playing, um, with, a, a few different original music projects. Um, so I have a couple that I'm considering working with. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't found the next like band that I want to like, you know, fully put myself into yet. Yeah. Uh, so I'm ready for that. I'm waiting for that. I have to just find the right fit. Um, but uh, I'm kind of being a chameleon right now. I'm kind of playing in, uh, you know, multiple different groups depending on what's going on. So, yeah, we yeah. played chameleon the other day. We did. Play. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm ready to to dive into uh, another rock band. Yeah, I miss it. I love giant guitar stacks and uh, <laughs> that huge giant sound. Yeah, yeah I love it. Feels good. Yeah, no, rock music is so much fun to play. It is. Yeah, there's no feeling like it. That's for sure. Being up on stage and rocking out, man. It's I know. Cool. I love it. But I also like putting bands together that are are not like really traditional, like a trombone and drum set and guitar. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. that's interesting. And throw a vocal. Yeah. That. You know, sort of like New York City subway style. Yep. Meets regular songwriting. How do you classify that? What genre is that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah no yeah. way of knowing just it is what it is man <laughs> yeah, putting people together that typically wouldn't play together and just seeing what comes out of that um i'm really interested in doing that and maybe you know being on the tiny desk concert the npr tiny desk oh. concert or something like that that'd be yeah i really enjoy that yeah That's i've applied i've applied for that <laughs> yeah. did you make a tiny desk video i did <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When did you do that, Aaron? That was during Kairos Quintet. Oh, you made oh. Yeah. I didn't know we even applied to that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, they uh anybody that doesn't know Tiny uh, NPR's Tiny Desk um series is great. You can find tons of awesome music on that set. Um the audition video requires you to make a video and have a tiny desk in your video. Yes. That's like the one criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's cool to see how many ways people can be creative with the tiny desk. <laughs> yeah, some people play it, some people smash it, some people stand on it, some people just have it in there. Yeah, desks are sometimes very tiny. Yep, um, like a little pizza table from the middle of a pizza, so the pizza doesn't get smashed. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah. It literally took the tiny. It took the tiny very literally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, um. I'm I'm in it for life, man. I'm in music for life. I love this instrument. I love the drum set, and I love playing in bands. My best friends have come from people that I've played with. Um, the first bass player I ever played with um, was in my wedding party, and you know we're still great friends. Um, he's still playing in punk rock bands in Richmond, and crushing it. And yeah, man, I'm I'm in it for life. I'm going to be an old man playing drums. Awesome. One band. One awesome. day. Some of you be like, damn, that guy's old. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, can he play. <laughs> you know, I'm to walk, man, to get to the drum set. But once you sit me down there, I'm going to be like, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Yep, yep. So I don't know, man. Um, 
I'm open to different styles of music as long as I feel good and I feel like I identify with it and um, I really love making original music. I love sharing our story, whatever it might be. Um, you know, imagine if Stevie Wonder never played his music. You know, we wouldn't have Stevie Wonder. Imagine all these people that we love, you know, that are huge influences to us. We needed to hear what they had to say. Mm -hmm. And just like that was the case for them, you know, we need to hear what each of you guys have to say as musicians um, and everybody listening. I want to know what your story is. I want to know what's on your mind, you know. Yeah, there's so. a whole bunch of untapped talent out there. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who just need to be inspired, you know, bring out that inner musician within them. And all of a sudden, you know, you may find yourself being the next Stevie Wonder or whoever it is. And, you know, never even knew that you had it in you. So, yeah, and you don't need to get to a point musically where you're quote unquote ready to be that. You can be that now. When mm -hmm. I, my first record, I don't know, do I have it, have it around here somewhere? I just moved. But um, when I started playing drums, I didn't know anything about what I was doing. But I met two guys that were a bass player and a guitar player. And I was like, I want to be a drummer. This sounds great. Let's do it. Bowgrass got a, got a drum set, invited them over, and we just started playing and figuring it out. And we made a record. Well, we made an EP uh, like four months later with a Tascam four track tape recorder and two SM58s in my basement. And it is hilarious. And I also love it because like I could barely play this instrument, man. But we were able to write songs and they're silly and ridiculous. They were about our teachers in eighth grade. And <laughs> like one, one of the songs like called Miss Chin about. <laughs> Uh, one of our teachers that had a huge chin and it was called juice man about this guy that sold juice on TV <laughs> an infomercial. And we just wrote silly songs. We were eighth graders, you know? Um, and then we sold those out of our lockers for $2 each. There you go. Wow. That was our first record. Uh, we actually had a disclaimer in the record that said warning. We cannot sing. <laughs> like you might want to buy this but you might not want to listen to it too much and right. people, we sold like a hundred of them out of our lockers sweet and <laughs> that's good that was our introduction to music business and songwriting and yeah. branding and all of that and yeah. from there we just kind of kept trying so if you're listening and you think you're not ready yet you're ready now yeah no time like the present go for it you don't need a you don't need a school of rock to make a band my my dad drove me around. My parents drove me to my friends' houses or drove friends to my houses. My first one of my first shows was at a house party. My dad drove us because we couldn't drive. Yeah. With all of our gear and then picked us up like later in the in the night. So you don't you don't need a teacher. You don't need a school. You don't need any of that. You just need to do it. To yeah. Try. Yeah, you need the passion. It be try have passion and be willing to fail and be okay with failing yeah it's like you were saying before you know some of these underprivileged kids they'll walk miles just to show up for for a concert because they're needed it's you know <laughs> they play a part in the bigger picture and that's i need to get there i need to be where where i'm supposed to be and if that means walking i'll walk if i have to and performing is addicting man like i can only go so long where i won't be you know it's funny my wife Paige she'll she'll be like you need to play a show like, <laughs> you need to play drums you're getting cranky like she can she can tell when it's been too long when I haven't practiced or haven't played a lot yeah, yeah. she's uh she's awesomely supportive at, at, at uh keeping me going and recognizing when I need a little push or you know that kind of thing so um it's so helpful when you're espoused does that for you yeah that's maybe a, they're doing it in partially in self-interest but you know, if, you are, if you are being cranky it, it's good for them i guess if you all right get it out of your system and then you can relax and yeah. I'm, the same, I'm the same way i i mean her support is huge i mean it, it's enabled me to continue to go i mean we have a room in our house dedicated to music i mean it's music is not ended because you know because i have a wife music has gotten better Music is getting bigger, it's getting more, it's getting more often. Like it's great. You know? It's uh it can it can it can be like that. 
or it can not be like that or it can crush your musical dreams you know whatever it depends on how you do it you yeah. know yeah. It, 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 it's a uh, you know it's a creative opportunity you got to write it yourself so well, i'm glad you're in a good situation and i'm i i'm inspired by the whole the whole idea of the social impact that we're having with our music and that's great. Well, I really appreciate you guys having me on to talk about uh, El Sistema stuff and drumming, and I really love talking about the intersection of drumming and guitar playing, which I think is interesting, and I'd uh, love to join you guys sometime in the future. Absolutely. Yes, we'd love to continue the conversation with you, Jeff. Excellent. Well, Aaron and Joe, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Joe Ham, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>